Amen. Thank you, Jeff. Please be seated. Well, it was a busy weekend on this campus on Friday afternoon. This auditorium was full of people from the community who had gathered to celebrate the life of a lady by the name of Alice Sweet. Alice was the grandmother of two little boys who attend Campbell Christian School. And as I listened to what people had to say and about the impact this place had on Alice's life, it just reminded me of how fortunate we are to have a school that meets in this place that provides a, a, a wonderful education, but more than that, ministers to the fam so many families within this community. Alice would come on Tuesday afternoons to attend the chapel service. She'd be at school events. But in the process, she became very comfortable and felt at home and like a part of this family. And I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you to Sean Stewart and Christina for the spiritual leadership they provide on this campus and to all the teachers who are part of this place. And, and I recognize there are teachers that are a part of a lot of different schools and you're, you're representing Christ in those places and so in no way I'm discounting what you're doing. But I am thankful for the mission that we have here as well. And so thank you for what you do. And then as was mentioned on Saturday afternoon, yesterday we gathered to celebrate the life of Luke Perkins. And in that moment, I was just simply reminded and overwhelmed by the importance of church family. Uh, I was touched by what Garth Heath shared about how he and Luke didn't necessarily see eye to eye on a lot of matters when it came to, to politics and worldviews, but yet they developed this, this deep, profound love for one another and friendship. And that's the power of the unity that we have in Jesus Christ. And as has been mentioned by Tim this morning in such a powerful way, I hope that we will always be a place that looks around and says, how do we be more open? This is a tremendously loving congregation, but, but even as a loving church, there are times that we can become focused and be comfortable with the people that we are around. And, and in some ways, without even recognizing, so I feel like I'm dropping out. Are we okay? And so let's, let's make sure that we're constantly aware, how do I be open, especially to those people that may not look exactly like I do or share the same views that I do, because there is a growth that takes place in being around people who are different than us. And so thank you, Tim, for reminding us of that, and thank you for the moment that we had yesterday and seeing the example of Luke and Garth and what they're able to establish, and I pray that will be a part of this legacy as a church for years and years to come. The name Art Modell may not be one that many of you recognize, but for most people in Cleveland, Ohio, it is a name that they will never forget. In 1996, Modell made the decision to do something he promised he would absolutely never do as the owner of the Cleveland Browns. He moved the team. And with that one decision, he instantly became the most hated man in Cleveland. For a few years, LeBron James was hated for jumping ship on Cleveland, but not even he reached Modell status. If Art Modell would have ever made the decision to step foot back in Cleveland after that move, which he never did, he was lucky to leave alive. So despised was this man the people in Cleveland threw huge parties when he died in 2012. They unabashedly shared their hope and desire that he would spend eternity burning in hell. Art Modell's name to this day is used as a curse word by many people in Cleveland. That's some serious hate, right? Now, Multiply that degree of hate by, say, 200, and you begin to have a pretty good idea of how many, uh, of how many ancient Jews about a follower of Jesus by the name of Paul. They hated him with a white-hot passion. Why? Because they were absolutely convinced that he was out to steal their religious franchise by convincing Jews to turn on their heritage and identity. And evidently this view, this narrative, was so prevalent and convincing that even some Jews who had turned in faith to Jesus Christ weren't exactly sure how to feel or what to believe about Paul. Was he friend? Was he foe? 
someone to trust? Or was he someone to keep? Listen to what we read in Acts chapter 21 and verse 21. But the Jewish believers here in Jerusalem have been told that you are teaching all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn their backs on the law of Moses. They've heard that you teach them not to circumcise their children or follow other Jewish customs. This rumor was one that no doubt many people had just decided was fact. And this is one of the reasons that the believers, as we talked about last week, did not want Paul to go back to Jerusalem. It was no secret that if he went back to that city that there were people there who were not only eager to celebrate, but to actually orchestrate his death. And that's exactly what happened. Because Paul did go back to Jerusalem when within days of stepping foot in that city, a group of Asian Jews brought an extremely serious charge against Paul. What was the charge? The charge was this, that he allowed a Greek into the temple. And that was a major no-no. While Gentiles were allowed to enter into the outer court, there were several inscriptions around the temple that stated it was absolutely prohibited from a non, for a non-Jew to enter into the, the court of Israel. To do so, it was a capital offense. 1935, archaeologists discovered one such sign that bared the following inscription. It said this, No foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the temple and enclosure. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. Did Paul hold contempt for Judaism? Was it true that he defiled the temple by bringing a Gentile into the inner court? He did no such thing. The truth is, the reason that Paul went to the temple on that particular occasion was to show allegiance and loyalty to his heritage by participating in a purification ritual that would allow him to pay the expenses for four Jewish men who were eager to fulfill their Nazarite vow. That being the case, on what basis did these Asian Jews make this particular charge? Did they just make the whole thing up? Well, not exactly, but they certainly didn't operate on fact. Listen to Luke's explanation, verse 29 of Acts chapter 21. For earlier that day, they had seen him in the city with Trophimus, a Gentile from Ephesus, and they assumed Paul had taken him into the temple. Did you catch that? They assumed. It's dangerous business to make assumptions, isn't it? You make assumptions, and that quickly leads to thoughts and feelings, and words, and actions. It oftentimes can do a lot of harm to people who are simply trying to do good. And does it seem to you that many people in society, and even the church, are quick to act on the worst assumptions. It does to me. And why are we prone to do that? Well, sometimes it's because we so dislike another person that it's easy for, for us to believe the very worst about them. And other times it's simply because we don't have the time or the energy to investigate the facts. Sometimes I don't want to have that awkward conversation to discover if what I think is true is actually true. And sometimes it feels like it's going to be a whole lot of work and it's going to require a lot of energy to get to the bottom of whether or not what I'm hearing about another person is actually right. Are there times when assumptions prove to be true? Well, of course, there are those moments. But as so often, our assumptions are off by a little, if not a lot. Now listen, this isn't the main point of the message this morning, but I think it's one worth making. A tremendous amount of misunderstanding and harm could be avoided 
If we'd simply discipline ourselves to only speak and act on what we know to be true and not on what we assume. This accusation made against Paul based on an assumption resulted in the Jewish people getting so upset that they they drug Paul out of the temple, the inner temple area. They just began to pummel him. And I don't know if they, they beat him with their fists or if they kicked him or if they threw rocks at him. I imagine they did all of the above. What I am confident of is this, is that they would have killed Paul if war didn't get back to the Roman authorities, the Roman troops, that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. Thankfully, it did. And when the Roman commander heard this news, he and some of his officers, they made a beeline to that situation. They got there as quick as they possibly could, and then they showed up. The city was so chaotic, they couldn't make sense out of who Paul really was, or what exactly he had done, and so they just took him into custody. And yet these people, these these Jewish people with their assumptions who were so upset, they continued to press in and demand that Paul be killed. We continue to read in 21, verse 35 through 36, when Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great, he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting, get rid of him. Now just so there's no confusion, that's a polite way of saying Kill the man. Kill him. It was in this moment as the Roman soldiers were trying to protect Paul from this hate-filled mob that Paul made the decision to wage defense. And so with the permission of the Roman soldiers, he stood before that that hate-filled crowd and he began to speak. In my mind, this is probably what the scene looks like. Paul is standing before them, blood trickling down his face, eyes beginning to turn black, lips swollen, ribs so bruised that every breath threatens to bring tears. What exactly does he say? He says, I'm guilty, but I'm not guilty as charged. I'm not guilty of trying to steal your franchise. I'm as Jewish as any law-abiding, Sabbath-keeping, circumcised-observing Jew can be. But I am guilty. Guilty as can be of carrying out the mission that I've been entrusted with by God. I am guilty of being a witness to all people of all nations. Okay, so is there anything that we can take away from this? I think there is. First, let's not do anything that would prove assumptions true. Now, here's what I mean. There are a lot of assumptions made by people about Christians, and today most of those are not good. In fact, it might be an interesting exercise if you would take the time this week in your home group or maybe in your family and examples of some assumptions that have made, been made that you've personally had to deal with. I, I'll get the conversation started. I'll highlight one. Many people who are not Christians make this assumption about Christians that we are out to make everybody else just like us. We want people to look like us and talk like us and think and act like us and vote like us that that's our big goal and if we accomplish this goal once we do then this is what's going to happen cheesy christian movies are going to be shown on every amc theater hillsong music is going to take over the airwaves Bikinis are going to be outlawed. Every restaurant like Chick-fil-A is going to be closed on Sunday. And every car that is sold will come with a Jesus fish decal. (laughs) And that scares people. And it scares me. But that's the assumption. 
that they believe this, and it scares them. And what happens when people get scared? Well, fear quickly turns to anger, and anger quickly turns to hate. And hate then ends up becoming vicious words, if not violent actions. And unfortunately, the Christian community has been guilty at times of living in a way that validates that concern. We've acted like our sole purpose is to Christianize a nation or the culture, but that's not the call. The call is not to Christianize, the call is to share Christ. And there's a big difference. When you Christianize, that leads to resentment. When you share Christ, Christ changes hearts. When Christ gets a hold of a heart, then culture begins to change in far bigger ways and more profound ways than simply new legislation. So here's my plea. My plea is simply this. Let's do everything we can in keeping in our, with our conscience to show kinship with those who hold false assumptions about us. Paul went through a purification ritual that cost him time and money simply to show his bond and appreciation for his fellow Jews and his heritage. At times, we've made it way too easy for people to assume the worst about us because here's what we've done. We've isolated ourselves. We've taken a position that we need to, to which completely withdraw from the world and just put up these barriers and protect ourselves. It's us versus them. And, and that's not going to change the culture in the right way. So I want us to encourage us to think about how do we show kinship, keeping with our conscience, with those who assume the worst about us. Work, meet the needs of the immigrant, the unwed mother, the person suffering with AIDS, with those individuals that don't necessarily share our same view about legislation or lifestyle how, how do we part those in our community who are serious about improving our educational system but they don't necessarily hold our same view about the role of god and creation or at the very least let's do this let's make sure that we're having meals with and sharing a lot of laughs with our neighbors who don't necessarily take the time to say a blessing before the meal and may even use colorful language in conversation. Let's think about how we show kinship. You ready for takeaway number two? Here's takeaway number two. Let's prove ourselves guilty. Guilty of what? Well, just like Paul, we are to bear witness to God's saving work through Jesus Christ. It's our responsibility to make known to our community the role God has played in history and the role God has played in our own personal lives. And if this is the case, why isn't there more sharing of Christ taking place today? Thinking, well, here's why, because it's scary. And it is. Yeah, and I won't argue with you about that for a, for a single moment. It is intimidating to share our faith in Jesus Christ, especially in a society that assumes the worst about you. So I'm not going to argue that point, but what I want to do is remind you of a couple of truths. Number one is this, is that God has prepared you to be his witness. The words of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 22 and verse 3 sheds insight into how God prepared Paul. Paul writes this, and then Paul said, or Luke writes it, but Paul says it. I, I'm a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, has, bro has brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. Paul was raised in one of the most influential cities in the ancient world, Tarsus. People from all over the region would come to this city because it was a place of, was a place of enterprise and exchange. So he's a young man, he's going to the city, people are coming from all these different places and he's being exposed to them, he's having the opportunity to meet them and he's learning things about different cultures, different cities, places that one day he's going to travel to as a missionary for Jesus Christ. Not only that, but this city was a place of scholarship and learning. 
It was an ideal place for a young man like Paul to be just rich in fluency in the Greek language, which was absolutely And so he's learning the world's language. But not only that, he receives the world's passport. He is a Roman citizen. Evidently, his dad was one of the Jews that was willing to pay a wage equal to two years' salary to guarantee Roman citizenship for his family. I'm probably around the age of 12 or 13, Paul moves and Jerusalem. Opportunity to learn under this Rabbi Gamaliel, the leading rabbi of the day. In doing so, he's learning the law, he's learning Jewish custom, and he excels at his studies. We're having mic issues, aren't we? He's excelling at his studies. So here's a young man that knows about the world. And he has the language. And, and he's, he has a passport to the world. And he knows the law. Who better to explain how Jesus Christ fulfilled the Old Testament law than this man who knows the law like few others? Here's the point. God thoroughly prepared Paul through rich and varied ways to fulfill his unique assignment to be a witness to Christ all over the world. And in the same way, God is faithfully preparing you to be a witness as well. Now, you may not see it as clearly, but God has placed you in certain places. God has allowed you to have certain experiences. God has exposed you to certain people. God has given you just the right personality and gifts and intellect. And he has allowed you to have certain learning experiences so that you might be his witness right where you are. The reason you're in the job you're in is because God has prepared you to be there at this particular time. The reason you live in that apartment complex or that neighborhood that you live in is because God has prepared you to live in that place right now to be his witness to your neighbors. He was thinking about this moment when you weren't thinking about it. He's thinking about people that you're not thinking about. He has prepared you for this moment. Now, you might be thinking, now maybe, but I've made such a mess of my life that it's, it's totally destroyed my witness for Christ at this point. Yes, you may have made a mess of your life, but I want to remind you of this. No matter how big that mess is, it's no bigger than the mess that God Paul, called Paul out of. And Paul speaks about his mess, Acts chapter 22 and verse 4 and 5. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison as the high priest. And all the council can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their, to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. He says, I made a mess in my life. But here I am by the grace of God being allowed to testify to the glory of Jesus Christ. And in the same way, what God did for the Apostle Paul, he will do for you. He will not only pull you out of the mess, but he will redeem the mess by making it one more ingredient that makes you an effective witness for his glory. Now, let me be personal for just a moment, and I, I don't want to overspeak about this, but I hope you see the relevance here. To the core of my being... I regret being a divorced man. If you ever wonder why God hates divorce, give me 15 minutes of your time. I can tell you about the pain and the, and the loss. I can tell you about the ugliness of divorce. 
And I absolutely abhor the things that I said and I did that contributed to my situation. Even if you're not the one who files for a divorce, I don't know any of us that walk away 100% innocent. Four years have passed, but to this day, there are still moments when, to tell you the truth, I want to hide from the world because I'm so ashamed. But I'll also tell you this, that God has used this part of my story to connect with and minister to people, people that I don't know as if I ever would have been able to connect with before. Because this is what our God does. He takes our mess, whatever form it comes in, and if we will trust him, he uses it as an ingredient to still fulfill his will. So God has prepared you, but he has also prepared people to receive the message. And here's the thing, it's not always the people that we anticipate or it's not always the people that we most desire. And sometimes that surprises us, but it really shouldn't. When you think about the Apostle Paul, who did he think he was going to reach in the city of Jerusalem? He thought he was going to reach Jews. But God had another plan. He drew up a different plan. Acts chapter 22 and verse 17 through 21. When I returned to Jerusalem was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and, bear, and uh, beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. It's heartbreaking when the people that you most expect to be receptive to your message absolutely reject it. When that unbelieving spouse or kids or even your closest friends show no interest in the message of Jesus Christ, it, it is devastating. To this dying day, Paul continued to weep for and pray for his fellow Jews to come to know Jesus Christ. On every opportunity, he would proclaim Christ to the Jews, but at the same time, he followed the leading of God, and he went to the Gentiles. And because he did, he had the opportunity to see countless numbers of people come to faith in Jesus. And what I want you to understand this morning is this, is that God is still preparing the hearts of people to receive the message of Jesus Christ. It may not be the people you expect, it may not be the people that you anticipate, but if you will follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and be a witness for Jesus Christ wherever and to whomever God sends you, you will see people come to faith in Jesus. Now, if you have been wondering where this church is going, been sitting back and listening for a while and thinking, what's, what's our vision, what's our mission, what are we about, please hear me clearly, this is it. This, this is it. We want to be a people, we want to be a church that helps the lost move to being found and those who are found being fully formed in Jesus Christ. That's it. You see, here's what we want. We want to be proved guilty of being disciples who make disciples. Praise team, if you'll go ahead and come up, we'll close in a song here in just a moment. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Apologies for the technical issues. I hope that you're able to hear everything okay. If you missed some blanks on your sermon outline because they're dropouts, email me. I'd be happy to send you a copy of the completed outline with all the blanks filled in, if that would be a benefit. If you're here this morning and you'd like the prayers of this congregation, know that we care about you, we love you, and we take prayer very seriously because we believe that God is active in our lives. We believe that God continues to do amazing, miraculous things in the lives of people. And so if we can pray for you today, if you're watching online, I would simply ask you to email us and we will pray for you this week. If you're here in person and you'd like a moment of prayer today, 
our shepherds and their wives. They'll be gathered around the auditorium or outside. Feel free to make your way to one of them for prayer at this time. If you're a guest this morning, thank you again so much for joining us today. I'd love to have the opportunity to meet you. I'll be standing outside. If you'll take just a moment, I'd love to get your name and spend a moment with you. Let's stand together and let's worship the Lord in song.